A quick disclaimer, opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Usain Bolt, look at the time, 958 world record. Blazing speed, Tyree Kill, electrifying. He can fly. If you ain't first, you're last. A player's 40-yard dash results at the NFL Combine, they can mean the difference in millions of dollars for elite athletes. Every decade, we see faster athletes in every sport across the board. In today's episode, Gray and Lee break down the anatomy of speed, discuss how athletes try to improve it, and what are some pitfalls when trying to obtain it. We cover pose running, quickness versus speed, and a lot more. So let's fire out of the blocks with this episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. He is gone. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. We're going to be talking about a topic that uh, I'm not sure who picked this one because obviously they have not seen Gray and I run, but we're going to do a little, in the words of the great Ricky Bobby, a little shake and bake today and talk about speed. You know, speed is definitely something that I think, especially growing up, um, everybody wants to run fast. You know, when you're growing up, you just want to run fast. You play tag in the, uh, in the playground. It's all about trying to get speed and run faster and, you know, even getting up to probably why the... NFL combines now on TV is to see how fast the 40 yard dashes are. Um, so there's a lot that uh, people want to talk about when you get into the speed, but I think what we're going to get into today is a little bit more of the intricacies of that and, and how do you make it and, and some things that may not be considered, but one thing I'll throw out there, Gray is, is, you know, how often do you run in a straight line when you're actually playing a sport? Not very often. <laughs> you don't. So I think there is some misconceptions out there about the importance of a 40 yard dash, but it does tell us something. You know, at the end of the day, we need to know who's the fastest person because there's certain things we may want to do. Um, and we know that we may want to get you more speed or get you faster. So, um, but I think you got a good story that probably early on kind of even led us to this point, um, maybe the foundation of, of getting us here. Somebody wanted you to get, take a look and try to figure out why this guy wasn't get faster. Yeah, well, it, it actually started. I, I, I had a lot of exposure to tennis, first of all, and I realized as a physical therapist, sports medicine guy, most of the injuries on a tennis court occurred during deceleration, not acceleration, yet 80% of the training time at most of the tennis camps I was consulting with were trying to make kids faster, not showing them how to stop. And when you put a bigger engine in a car and don't have enough money to put bigger brakes in a car, you just created an accident. It just hasn't happened yet. But the story Lee uh, was just referring to was me being flown to a very um, prominent football D1 university with one of the first publicized cases of a sports hernia, osseitis pubis. It's when when you create that hernia by training as opposed to being born with a hernia mm-hmm. or, or getting a tear in your abs. Now, at the time, there was not a lot of research on sports hernia, even though ESPN's been talking about it for eight or nine years. Way before that, we had one of the fastest kids in college football coming up as a freshman who had his abs and adductors, his inner thigh, rip off of his pubis, and they had to be surgically reattached, only to be ripped off again and then surgically reattached. They want me to fly out and evaluate this kid and find out what's the problem. Well, what happened was this kid, arguably probably one of the top three speed kids in the country recruited to D1 football had a summer before he had to show up to camp and got involved with a um a, a camp that was dedicated directly to speed uh, you know and it was one of those high speed treadmills and it's going very very fast and you're trying to run as fast as you can uphill it is forcing mechanics and if you got good mechanics it'll force you maybe into a better place don't know how to dose it but it'll force you in a better place if you don't have good mechanics, 
it's not going to be good. Well, this is how this kid spent his summer. Now, number one, decision, he's already top three fastest kids in the country. That means only two people in the world in the world can catch him. <laughs> Why is he working on speed? Is this his weakest link? But nevertheless, we got a fast kid doing a very unnatural movement. Turns out he has a dorsiflexion problem on one of his ankles. That means that ankle doesn't bend. And you're never in the presence of a dorsiflexion problem more than in a deep squat or walking uphill. Those are the two things that force the natural buffer of dorsiflexion that he didn't have. So what does a fast, unbelievably explosive type one guy do when he has a different stride on one side than the other? Because the high speed incline forces that. He makes up for it at his pelvis. And he literally loosened his pelvis and created these tears. When he started training with weight, that imbalance and that looseness in his pelvis only got exercise more and he had these tears. After the fact, I'm out there at this university. I'm in the team room, theater style. I'm standing with this kid. He's in his tidy whities in the front row, a few orthopedic surgeons, team physicians. The whole sports medicine staff was there. And I started what was our old functional exam. We, there was no such thing as a movement screen at the time, but I did want him to go through many of the movements that are similar to the top tier in the SFMA. And I started at the ground looking at ankle mobility, knee flexibility up through the hips, just full body. And I had one of the physicians stop me three minutes in and said, dude, he's got pubalgia. He's got a sports hernia. Why are you looking at his whole body? And I'm like, because I don't think he was born with a birth defect. I think something caused this. And sure enough, one ankle was locked up. The kid couldn't even balance on one foot. And I said, is this something that has been here since your surgery? He goes, no, this ankle, I sprained it right before I started training. I just thought training would loosen it up. Well, lo and behold, I just have this epiphany in front of this audience of people that, oh, nobody has an appreciation of function. They thought you can just work on speed because you're slow. And the only reason you're slow is because you haven't worked on speed. No, there are lots of reasons you can be slow. And many of these reasons won't tolerate a speed approach until you fix them. And that's where we were with this kid. Now, his career didn't go as well as it easily could have had some of those decisions not been made. But on the plane flight home on seven Delta napkins, I drew stick figures of positions I would have loved to seen this kid get in before somebody put him on a high-speed treadmill because if he couldn't get into a deep squat and a equal lunge left and right and a hurdle step left and right, I'd have said, I like the high-speed treadmill, not for him and not today. It's, it's no good is going to come of it. So I don't even think we would have the movement screen we have if I hadn't seen a bunch of people, a room full of people who were more accomplished in their discipline than me all overlook function just so they could get an extra fraction of speed. Well, the, the moral, the, the real underlying component, not so much the movement screen, Gray, but is that the most important thing for this individual to be working on? And when we talk about speed, again, it's cool. It's what we all want. We all want to be faster. But how do you get there? And getting more speed may not be working on speed. You, you got it. When, when the, the last three years I was a PE teacher, my volunteer PE teacher, we had the, the four Bs we went through with the kids. Breathe, bend, balance, and bounce. And I consider your speed using your bounciness to cross ground at a very high rate. If you're slow, don't worry about bounce. What's your balance like, right? Oh, your balance is off? What's your bending like? Meaning if your balance is wrong, what's wrong with your flexibility? Oh, nothing? Then you got a balance problem. But if you got a flexibility problem, you don't have a balance problem until you don't have a flexibility problem. And if you got a flexibility problem, what's your breathing like? And we go right back to your worst pattern in your worst position and say, well, if you're hyperventilating, maybe that's driving the whole thing. Let's learn to live in half kneeling. Let's learn to live in a deep squat. Let's learn to live in a leg raise. And so my kids very quickly, when they weren't as fast as they wanted to be, were told, don't question your speed, question your balance. Oh, don't question your balance, question your flexibility. Don't question flexibility, what's your breathing like? And this anxiousness in half the cases is driving poor movement. It's not going to fix everything, mm -hmm. but it's like go back from speed. So if speed's the problem, 
or, or, or if speed is the most evident problem, don't assume that's where you start to fix speed is, is the way we did it with the kids. And they got it, the four Bs. So one day on the balance beam, a kid's not doing well, and every other kid goes, go do your bending. And they do a toe touch progression. They come back and their balance is good. And so it's always work on the level below it. And every level of physicality is below speed. Speed is the expression of everything working together at impeccable timing. So that cannot be the only problem. And if it is, please prove it first. So that's, that's where we're, we're at with that. But one of the things that, that I look at is just like an FMS, we say move well, then move often. One of the, one of the best articulations and quick uh, remedies for poor running quality, poor jogging quality, is some of the information I've seen through Dr. Romanov and his introduction of pose running. And what he's basically saying is there's a snapshot you're looking for in the way somebody leans and deals with their own body weight and gravity. And if you don't see that, you should probably coach them into that space. What we realize is if they can't be easily coached into that space, maybe they can't get there. And that's where I think FMS can, can add. Well, Greg, that. that's a good point because I think too often people look, people gravitate to the top runners in the world you know, the Usain Bolts of the world and say, okay, he's the fastest human. Let's do exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that many times can create problems. So you, they take that snapshot. They say, well, this is the biomechanics. This is what he's doing. He's got this type of stride. He's got this type of posture, not realizing that I can't do that physically. You may not be able to do that. And certainly maybe the 15 year old that is trying to get faster may not be able to do those things that you're trying to get them to do so you have to stay, take a step back and go from, you know, balancing to bending or bending to breathing. So I think that's part of the problem that a lot of us are faced with is that you take the, what's, what's the best in the world and try to replicate that. Yeah. And, and, and I think the best in the world can't even tell you how they do it because they've always been the fastest one in the room. The room just keeps getting bigger. You know what I'm saying? They've, they've always been there. So it's like somebody who's born with a talent to sing. They, they just can. And yeah, we can refine that, but we already started way above average. And so what we, what we realized uh, when I got back from that plane flight <laughs> is I said, guys, let's start looking at this. And literally Lee took the first deep dive and he introduced movement screening at the high school physicals. And he and the orthopedic surgeon had a conversation and, and the orthopedic surgeon was already watching kids deep squat. And Lee goes, why are you doing that? And he goes, well, the ones that can't usually end up in my office halfway through the season, <laughs> regardless of what position they're playing or how much time they get. And, and so he and Lee had this great movement talk. And all of a sudden, this little brainchild that we had in the clinic off these napkins became refined into a movement screen. He put it right in the physical, and sure enough, it lined up with a lot of the problems he was getting ready to react to. Now he could respond to them proactively. Mm -hmm. so. so, but you know, it's always interesting to me, though, Gray. When going back to your story, is that you put somebody on? A, you're trying to create speed. So let's let's kind of get away from our world a little bit and just take a step back and look at this practically, right? You're trying to create speed one on someone who's already one of the top people in the world. Probably not the best strategy. Let's go figure out what they need. All right. So we kind of pin that and say. That's a no-brainer. But why in the world would you take somebody that you're trying to create speed with and make them run uphill? That just doesn't make any – because you're going to be slower running uphill than you are downhill. So even biomechanically, that doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion. Well, if you think back, and many people won't even recognize this name, but a guy named Walter Payton, one of the most famous running backs, Chicago Bears, um, Sweetness, actually ran up a hill for his training but there wasn't a motor deciding his mm -hmm. speed. And I think one of the reasons a natural runner, Jerry Rice did the same thing. They would find a hill, they would run in sand, they would run up hills, but it is a self-limiting movement as long as you don't add a motor and a program to it. Meaning go run up a hill. If you don't pick up your feet, if you don't dorse flex your ankles, if you don't get those knees high, you're going to have your face in the ground. And so all these guys that had these high rep movements would run up a hill to true their form. And to Lee's point, if you want to actually experience speed, 
run down a hill, and now that's your RPMs. You got to cycle this good pattern faster. So get the good pattern on the incline, build some strength, posture, integrity, and then recycle it faster downhill. And it's just like we talk with baseball pitchers: slightly heavier ball forces better mechanics. Slightly lighter ball allows you to move faster. And so it's just that: do we want to load you for form? posture and and capacity, or do we want to unload you for an expression of maybe greater potential? And I think that's the key is why do you want to put somebody running uphill? You want to make them run uphill to infor- make sure they are using good dorsiflexion, good hip flexion. That's what that's for. Because you've got to do great. If you're not, like, as you said, if you don't use a good amount of dorsiflexion, you're going to face plant. If you don't use a good amount of hip flexion, you're going to face plant. You know those things are needed to run uphill. And then what's your posture like? Well, you're leaning a little forward. So all those things are really, really important to help set the foundation. But the key thing is, if you don't have a good amount of hip flexion or dorsiflexion, you're not going to, you're going to compensate and create some problems. So running uphill is good if you're ready and running uphill, running downhill is good if you're ready. Well, two assumptions that were made in this case and, and had this gone to a, lawsuit, I've had to be an expert witness quite a few times. I would have said there was no um, reconnaissance of any problems. And the assumption was, this is a very fast guy. I'm going to improve his speed. And even if I don't, since I trained him a little bit, I can take Mm -hmm. credit for some of his accomplishments later on. So there's a reason. And nobody can sell you time on a hill, but I can sell you time on a treadmill that you can't find in your own local you know, store or something like that. So I think there was probably good intent, but there was really poor professionalism in this situation because to, to summarize what you just said, this is a professional that forced unnecessary compensation and, and, and you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You you can't do that. And if you don't understand why that's wrong, you may want to reevaluate the whole reason you're trying to help with movement in the first place, which is there, there's always got to be time to check the air and the tires. There's always got to be time. I mean, we, you know, in every other profession, we do diligence. You know, most airline problems were fixed with standard operating procedure. You know, it just, it just is. And, and so many people feel they're above that, or I'm working with an elite person, so I don't have to do that. That's the one time it's going to bite you. So, um, go ahead. So we've established on the show that I am not a runner. And I should probably, I'm of Irish heritage and I should probably be pulling a plow behind me, not necessarily (laughs) running anywhere. Um, But I have actually some experience with these high intensity training, like um, treadmill running. Uh, I actually was put into a program when I was a teenager and I was a cheerleader and a dancer. So why I was even put in this program, I'm really not sure. It actually probably damaged my ankles going forward. Um, But Moving on, I, I do have the question, like, what's the difference between quickness and speed? Is there a difference? I think that you can have people that obviously possess both, both talents, but I would say you can express your quickness in multiple directions within three steps, and it's a whole body thing. Whereas even though speed is a whole body thing, as, as Lee said, it's either linear like track and field or it's mostly linear with a little bit of adaptability like a running back would have to do. So I would say, you know, when you're thinking about martial arts, gymnastics, and close to the net play in tennis, that's quickness. Shortstop, second base, that's quickness. When you get into a running back, a wide receiver, track and field, uh, soccer, when somebody's on a break, that's when you really mm-hmm. see speed. When, when there's enough time for you to see a person pull away from the pack, that speed. You don't see quickness because I used to make this comment with a lot of the NBA teams we worked with. The illusion of quickness is actually decelerating quicker than your opponent, changing direction and starting again in another direction. And they didn't. And so it looks like you out quicked them. You didn't. You stopped better mm-hmm. and started better than they did. So the I think quickness has a lot more deceleration, whereas um Speed has a lot more momentum conservation. Yeah, I think the the one thing Ashley you alluded to is you're to a degree every one of us are predisposed to be have a little bit more speed and quickness than others. Some people are predisposed based off their you know get into the weeds a little bit muscle fiber type. Mm-hmm. You know, are you more aerobic or are you more anaerobic? 
Um, so in, in all of us, even when you're at a young age, we know who the fastest kid in the room is. And it's not because they trained. It's because they were born that way. Um, and there's only so much you can do to train somebody to get a little bit quicker. And that's okay. That as long as, you know, that is what it is. We're always going to train. Um, but I think the one thing also great to, to what Gray was alluding to as well is the deceleration factor when you talk about quickness is what's primary is you've got to make sure that they have the ability to stop and change directions and throw on top of this, I'm going to, I'm going to throw gray, throw gray a little pass here is also reaction time being able to know if I'm going forward and I've got to stop and react, if I'm going to go up for a rebound. I've got to get to that ball quicker than you. And that's quickness. So it is a combination of being able to decelerate, but also the neuro underlying neurological factor that has to be played into that or reaction time. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And if you have great reaction time and average quickness, you look quicker than somebody who doesn't. And, and let's go back to uh, Dennis Rodman. Way back in the last dance, Dennis Rodman is pulling down way more rebounds than most people, and yet he's got one of the worst vertical leaps on the court. So how does, how does a power guy deal with that? This is not a great vertical leap. Yes, he let, he's getting rebounds. The guy knows trigonometry. He knows where the ball's going to be. He's just got to be there. The quickest jumper gets the ball, not the highest jumper, because Dennis has already done his thing. Mm -hmm. You can jump higher than him, but only on paper. <laughs> and, I, and I think part of that, you know, when we start looking at what a lot of parents are, are searching for now is they've got their kids in these, you know, Ashley, Ashley just, just mentioned it. You know, you put these kids in these programs early on um, trying to get them a scholarship or trying to get them to that next level of their sport. And at some level, it, you know, the reason we test for that is to see where you are. And then at some level, then it's about skill. Then it's about, okay, let's check that box. I don't need to worry about that. Now I need to refine it. We need to talk about the intricacies or the skill of that, whether you want to talk about how your throwing mechanics are, maybe, you know, getting to the ball a little bit quicker. Those are the things that then can be tackled as opposed to worrying about, let's try to get you just a little bit faster. Okay. And, and, and here's where I want to give credit because you know that I didn't even want to talk about kettlebells till I went through the process. I didn't want to talk about dry needling till I went through the process and got credentialed. And I have very little background in pose running. But this past year, I got with um, Tracy Peel, a, a pose running coach, a speed coach that works in a, in a lot of different sports. And he came down to the gym with Trey Belcher and I. And we actually processed six people and I wanted to watch him coach, and he wanted to watch Trey and I do corrections and, and things like that. And it was amazing to get the pre-video of somebody running. And he was walking us through, you know, they're actually, most people who aren't as fast as they want to be are actually accelerating and slowing down and accelerating and slowing down. They're not really conserving that momentum with a forward lean. So what Tracy was doing in a very elegant way is getting them to lean forward and pick their back foot up quicker and get it back down quicker. And for those who run like me, which is a start, stop, start, stop, poke holes in the ground, it was like, this feels like I'm wasting time. And yet on time and video, I'm covering greater distance in shorter time. So we went outside and we ran them for speed but we videoed their quality. And I think in four of the six cases, Tracy was able to cue them into a much better speed package with way, way better awareness right away. Two people, he hit a wall. I brought them over, did some correctives, got that wax out of their proprioceptive ears, so to speak. I got the ankle, I got the hip, I got the T-spine rotation, sent him back, and then he had something to work with. So he and I got to sort of play jazz, each of ours using our instrument in an elegant way. And it's been really cool to see how quick his drills work when you're ready. And when you're not ready, that's what I didn't want him to do. Dude, you got a good drill. Just don't drop, drop it 10 minutes from mm -hmm. now because I'm going to go get some mobility for you to work with. So two primary ways you could potentially get faster, going from point A to point B. Let's just say that. Either lengthen your stride to cover more ground, right, or change your RPMs. And I think most of the running experts would say change your RPMs, meaning what you just said, don't be on the ground as long. Right. You want to basically just 
get that foot out there and get it back off the ground as quick as possible. And when slow people try to run faster, the very first thing they do is lengthen their stride. That's right. Which makes them slow down more mm -hmm. between each stride cycle. So there was a lot of elegance and, and simplicity in some of the underlying tenets of pose running. And I got to give Dr. Romanoff huge credit. Not only was he an athlete, he was a coach. He understands biomechanics and he can go deep. But the fact that he gave us these snapshots of what to look for and how to get there quick. And all I tried to add was, and some people aren't ready for the lesson, but we can get them ready way quicker than you think with 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 screening and things like that. So it was it was really good for me to watch a lot of different body types and a lot of different speed issues wind up benefiting from a one-two punch or going right into just better coaching. And one of the things that emerged from this is we've got a thing called the um, uh, motor control screen. And it's basically a balance test. And it came right out of the, the Y balance test with Phil Plisky. And what Trey and I did is a motor control screen before Tracy's lesson, which was a very short lesson, probably not lasting over a half hour with very few sprints and just a few drills. The people who didn't need me to correct them first, who went right into the lesson, got better balance and motor control just by working on running form. And this is something that goes back to a conversation I had with Kelly Starrett. If you just enforced good form in deadlifting, we wouldn't have nearly as many problems. Mm -hmm. the, the stability work that most of us are doing too much of would be done if we established breathing and bending first. So <laughs> your state of readiness, you matching your breath to your kettlebell swing or your sun salutation, making sure you can cover the mobility, and then simply just do it right. Don't do a lot. Don't do them and post your numbers. Just do it right and let somebody who is an expert tell you if it's right or not. You don't get to tell yourself and your workout partner doesn't get to well, tell you. Well, one thing you mentioned, I think, you know, we talked about the lower body and, and how you've got to have good dorsiflexion and you got to, in essence, decrease your stride length and just try to have more repetitions. But one thing you threw in there that you was real quick, but it's important, is don't underestimate the influence of the upper body in this. Oh, if someone all. has some upper body mobility issues, you're not going to coach them into better form running. And believe it or not, once they start running for speed and training, it's going to affect their breathing. The way you carry your shoulders, your neck, your sternum, and your rib cage posture, if you're bracing in your traps and neck and front part of your neck because your core isn't aligned with what your hips are doing, which is exactly what's going to happen, you will brace with the only thing you got left, which is that upper carriage, not your core, then at the same time you need better breath, you're not going to have the mechanics to do it. But I just want everybody to hear, all we did for four out of six of those people was a little bit of running technique that was counterintuitive. And if you're slow, you got to admit what I think will make me faster probably isn't going to make me faster. So I need to go counterintuitive for a minute and their balance got better. Now we didn't do one thing to work on balance. So when you're training good technique, the technique that you need, usually the central nervous system says, Oh, wow, we were facing left thinking we were looking right. Now we know what looking right is. And so balance isn't supposed to get better if you don't train balance. And yet we train the elegance of what natural running form was and balance got better. So without any balance corrective at all, the proper technique made enough of a difference for me to support everything he just did because I tested and retested it and I had that baseline. For the people that we had to correct first, their balance got better too, but they got a one-two punch. They got a little bit of movement reclamation and they got a little bit of running instruction and that one-two helped that percentage. So if you can recognize that running, that, that movement problem first, get it off the table. Speed will be there on the back end and that lesson will be more applicable at that time. What does the upper body look like in pose running? Um, I've, we've got some really great before and after pictures. The, it, I, I, as a physical therapist, I immediately notice the difference in the neck position first and the amount of arm extension that seems to complement that quick extension stride in the leg. So the arms somehow look more in sync with the legs. The body leans forward at the ankle, not at the waist. And then the neck comes back on top of the shoulders 
And I, most of us can't deny the airway just got better. So a lot of, uh, what happens is our previous pictures of people, the snapshots of people, they, they looked exactly like you opened up with. They look like they're pulling a wagon or a plow <laughs> and they, they goes, it's like they're, they're bent in half mm-hmm. here. And when they got into pose, they just got that natural. Yeah, it should be a, basically a straight line from your ankle all the way up to your like ear. Like a Heisman Trophy, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just that perfect silhouette of you are, it's like if we stood you up straight, you'd be in perfect alignment. And then we just leaned you forward and, and you're in alignment forward. And these wheels are just blurry up under you. And the, the great thing for me to hear is unsolicited, most of these people said, it was easier to run at the end of the lesson than before, and yet they were on their 10th or 12th wind sprint. They're not, it's not supposed to be easier unless you're just grossly inefficient. Which is, one, which is the main reason if you're a runner, high speed, low speed, whatever it is, and you're going to try to run correctly, you've got to have good ankle mobility, which then tells us why ankle mobility is such a risk factor or lack of ankle mobility is such a risk factor for injury. And, and, and let me just interject one thing. Don't assume cause or correlation. Just assume what Lee said. Ankle mobility problems are the tip of a big iceberg or a little iceberg. They're either an isolated problem, and if you fix it, all things get good, or the ankles are behaving this way because the hips, back, neck, and left shoulder don't know where they are, and, and just like running on ice. Every, every step is not doesn't look like the one before. It's just this inconsistency, and that's what compensation looks like. It's highly inefficient fatigues you quicker and just it looks like sloppiness. Mm. And so we're we're not saying ankles cause problems um or or anything, but you always see ankle mobility problems in association with major uh on feet movement problems like yeah. squat hurdle step. And, and I lunch. think the point is we're talking about speed. It's pretty evident that if you don't have good ankle mobility, you can train speed all you want, but there's gonna be a plateau. And if you continue going down that path, you may lead yourself into problems. Yeah. And and there's one other way to describe it. Too. Not that just fixing your ankle is going to be the solution. Yeah. If I got a bungee cord this long, I can only stretch it this long. If I got a bungee cord this long, it becomes exponential. I can almost double its length. I can use it. If you got an ankle mobility problem, how are you going to trigger the plyometric reaction of your posterior chain? Because you've got that myotatic reflex, that muscle tendon junction that's Pretty elastic. Easy here, big fella. <laughs> we have a great right, ankle so. mobility YouTube video that we can we can add so, somewhere yeah. on the screen to link so, to. So, what you, I mean, basically though, don't go into the myotatic thing. Okay. But what you're saying is basically when you you've got to have if you want to create more speed power, you've got to have that elasticity because it's like a rubber band the more you stretch it the more when you release it it's going to snap at you right that's all it is and if you don't have good mobility you can't stretch that rubber band as much right so we we create a potential of greater elasticity and then through technique and sets and reps we teach you how to use that so it's not all just this muscle drive because let me give you the counterpoint swimming in a pool uses almost no elasticity it's almost all biomechanics and cardio, but elegant runners use gravity to their advantage and poor and slow runners use gravity as a, as a disadvantage. So that's, that's what it is. So when looking, um, at the pose running, I I just have to ask the camera was from the side angle, right? So you can see a person from the side, you're not filming them from the back and looking at foot placement or anything. A good pose coach can use any angle. But I think the angle that helps the student's awareness the quickest is the one from the side. FMS One is designed for fitness, healthcare, and performance professionals who are looking to evaluate and understand how well their clients, patients, and athletes move. This is a highly interactive certification course that equips you with the tool industry leaders use to guide their programming decisions. During this course, you will learn how the seven fundamental patterns of the movement screen relate to and affect many of our daily activities and how mobility, motor control, and functional pattern concepts play a role in the screening process. You'll be able to identify correct screening techniques and common mistakes so your screen results are consistent and reliable. The FMS1 learning environment consists of a movement lab, performing the screen with your peers, and engaging in screening demonstrations with your instructors. 
Are you ready to have a reliable tool that sets a movement baseline and provides a tight feedback loop to guide your programming decisions? Take a look at our upcoming courses and get started today. We talked about fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. What are the distinguishing differences? Like, how can you tell? I have three kids. What, what should I be looking for? Well, one, when you're, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, one, well, you're predisposed. Like there's going to be, and everybody has a little bit of both. Some people are going to have more than the other. Um, you're talking about speed versus endurance, for lack of kind of just making this kind of surface level or easy. Um, but I think most people know who the fastest kid is in the room. You know, the, the, the type, the anaerobic are going to come in and, and the muscles will be a little bit bigger. Um, they'll be a little bit thicker and the, uh, you know, aerobic person coming in, they're going to be the skinny person who can run all day. Um, you know, I'm, I probably have a little bit of both. Um, I don't think I'm probably predisposed one side or the other. I don't like running long distance, but back, back when I was younger, I could, I could, I was pretty quick. So I had decent speed. Um, so I think that's, that's probably the easiest, you know, kind of way to look at it. In my opinion, you're not going to know for sure, unless you take a, you know, muscle biopsy and mm -hmm. really go in there and go crazy with it. So you don't necessarily want to do that. There's no reason to do it, but you're going to know. And, and as, as people grow and develop when, you know, as a parent looking at your kids, um, you can, you should be able to just look and when they run and when they're doing stuff, start to figure it out because people gravitate to what they're good at. And the kids that want to go out and play tag, they probably are a little bit quicker than the ones that would rather say, nah, I don't want to go play tag, but you know what? I don't mind going over here and walking for five minutes or 10 minutes or running or whatever long distances. So, you know, you're not going to know, but I think most of us can, can just look and see what you gravitate to. Yeah. So it's that. And then frame is something that you think. Frame is definitely something that you can look at. The, the you know, the, you, you don't see a lot of uh, really beefed up muscular marathoners. In, in my undergrad education, exercise science, we, we had a few professors that were very much into talking about fiber. But as Lee said, you don't know unless you take a biopsy. Mm -hmm. And even when you do know, you can't do anything about it. And, and, and most of the debate will come in from the scientists. Well, you do have fibers that can go either way and be trained a little bit. But for the most part, if you're born with the aptitude of a marathoner or a long-distance swimmer, that's probably going to be your thing. It doesn't mean you can't get faster, but it means it's not what you were built for. So we can get you close. But what they didn't talk a lot about was biomechanics, movement behavior, you know, and things like that. And so, you know, you're going to be surprised that some accomplished marathoners have way more fast twitch than you thought. And some unbelievably explosive people don't have an impressive amount of fast twitch, but their tibia femur length is really good for jumping or something mm -hmm. like that. So I, I think that long, lengthy conversations about fiber type are best left to geneticists and, and, and you know, scientists because it doesn't change what you and I would do if I were trying to make you faster, Ashley. I just know that when we hit your limit of progress, we've probably hit your genetic potential. And that's where efficiency comes in. Yes. I mean, that's where... You know, I think grapes from day one, our goal has been, okay, if you run a 40-yard dash at X speed, great. We may be able to get you a little faster, but if we can make you be able to do that and sustain that over time, that to me may be more important than just seeing how far you, how fast you can run a 40. Consistency of speed, I think, especially for some of the teams we've worked for, is more important than that one-off great 40 that you can only reproduce on a full moon in the summertime. You know, and which is exactly that's that's the forty people are going to give you your right. best bench press ever is the one people are going to talk about forty years later, not the one you're currently doing. Right, and speed somewhat is relative, right? I mean, if I'm if I'm a really slow individual and I get just a little faster, I may think, "Wow, this is fast," <laughs> right? Yes. If I'm going five miles an hour and I get up to seven, whew, that's pretty good compared to somebody else who normally is running, you know, ten, twelve miles an hour and they get up to thirteen. It's a whole lot harder the faster you are to make you a little faster, right? right? My golf game is a whole lot easier going from a 25 handicap to a 15. Right. It's a whole lot harder going from a 15 to a 10. Yeah, the margin of error goes down. And I'm glad you mentioned efficiency because that's where I'd really like to, to encapsulate this discussion of running. Uh, I'm uh, 
I've got a slight man crush on a guy named Phil Maffetone right now. He was uh, an accomplished chiropractor all as far back in the 80s, and he was right there in the beginning of triathlons when people were trying to do more and more and more, faster and faster, faster. And he realized having a chiropractic background that when I take you out and watch you walk, jog, or run, if I look at you going slightly faster, faster, and faster, at the point where you depart from good mechanics, what's your heart rate? And he goes, I never want you crossing that. Now, what that is for most people, every one of us in this room would probably go out on a jog and be running at a cardiovascular rate, maybe 10, 15, 20 beats higher than we could maintain good steady state aerobics. And Phil's hypothesis, which I think is elegant and beautiful because the well-often thing that we use for movement, he's doing that for your maximum aerobic capacity, okay, Um, or functioning. And what he said is, let me put a limit on your heart rate. And, you know, he would assign me something like 130 at my age. I want you to go out for a half, see how far a distance you can go in a half hour, not going above 130 or dropping below 120. And what you will find the very first time you do it is you'll walk half of that run. Okay. But in two weeks, you will go a significantly further distance, meaning you will learn to stay in the slot that you can do all day, but most of us don't know where that slot is. So we deal with lactic acid poor mechanics and early fatigue, inappropriate breathing mechanics and asymmetry. So Phil Maffetone started his cardiovascular recommendation watching biomechanics. And he said, where you break your biomechanics is where I'm going to limit you. And he had that great connection between what's your cardiovascular limit. Because I could give you all the pose running information, biomechanical things, warm up, pre-stretch and FMS seal of approval, your mechanics are good, and you could go out 15 beats higher than you can own and crash the whole damn thing because you're outside of a sustainable, reproducible running package. So if we're going to talk FMS and pose on the quality of your movement and running, I don't think we can not acknowledge the great contribution that Phil gave us. And it's as counterintuitive as the short high RPM stride that we talked about earlier. It's counterintuitive to run at that slow a heart rate. And then all of a sudden, what if you're running faster and further at the same lower heart rate? Mm-hmm. That's efficiency. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's great. And, and if you want a quick flyby, Maffetone has done quite a few books, but Peter Atia just did a wonderful podcast with Phil Maffetone. And I was so glad to hear him put voice to some of those words that I've read. It's a great podcast. Is there a formula for that? It's 180 minus your age and it's humbling and there's an adjustability there because Phil even says that number means nothing. It's simply a starting point, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and, um, what he said is if you're really compromised and just doing this for the first time, you're probably going to want to take 10 beats off of that. If you're in, not quite sure, take five beats. If you're pretty middle of the road fit, you know, but trying to get better, do 180 minus your age. And if you are fit and just trying to push yourself a little bit, you can add five or 10 beats. But getting your heart rate, uh, that 180 and your age right there, and I, I tried it. This is one of the things I was doing. I was studying a lot of his material after my neck surgery. And the first time in my life I ever ran four continuous miles. Uh, was when I observed what he said before that. I was fine with two or three miles trail running, but it wasn't comfortable. And I did four miles every day for about 10 days, never had any pain, soreness, but you have no idea how slow those miles were. But I didn't post it. I didn't care. And I checked my ego at the door. And, and it's that kind of four weeks of investment that I find the world doesn't have time for right mm-hmm. now. And I can't figure out why. <laughs> Because you do have time to do it slow and let these let this feedback come to you. I don't need the internet to know what I think, you know. And so you got a baseline, just like a movement screen. Phil gave it to us and said, "Now watch what your body does when you bracket your your um, energy expenditure and allow your mechanics, breathing, and awareness to refine itself." So, I, I, big props to to his work. So to wrap up this episode, what? In your experience, both on the field as an athletic trainer, uh, having seen so many athletes, professional, football, soccer, rugby, what, who tends to be the fastest athlete? 
other than obviously the true running, sprinting, you know, the runners. It's it's a different basketball. It's a different kind of speed, and I got way more exposure to football than I do soccer. So some of the best examples of speed, power, agility, and quickness uh, come to me from football just because of where I was born and what I've done. Mm -hmm. I think the equal thing exists in soccer. I'm just not quite as close to it um, as as I should be. (laughs) I I think there's no question it's soccer. In my opinion, you asked our – my opinion is definitely soccer. Now, you know, you take take football kind of out of the equation because you don't have – the way Americans play football mm-hmm. in Europe, because it would be very interesting, interesting to see if you, ta- if you took football out of the equation in the United States, some of those athletes, it would be really, really inter- interesting to see how some of those American football players would do on the soccer field. Mm-hmm. I think they do quite well. Um, but I do think just the way this, the sport of soccer is play, played, they have such a burst of speed. And then they walk take a few seconds to walk mm-hmm. and then it's a burst of speed. Um, football players, the average, the average play is what? Three to five seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're looking at a soccer player that's going to go balls out <laughs> for, you know, the length of the field, some of them. So that's, what's impressive. Have you had any experience or watched much rugby? No. Even less oh. rugby than soccer, but I, I can, I can oh see gosh. the, I can see the same thing. And think about this. Football and basketball are highly specialized. Each position has an archetype that goes with it. Soccer, hockey, and rugby, the people are largely the same size. And there's no such thing as a hockey player that can't skate well. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of football players that don't run well because they don't have to run. That's not what their position says. So I think what we've got in America is highly specialized archetypes for football and basketball. Um, You get over into hockey, soccer, and rugby – everybody's got that propulsion skill set, some a little bit better than others, but everybody's got to run today. Everybody's got to skate yeah. today. <laughs> so again, I, th- I think it goes back to this misconception of why, of why everybody thinks you have to run so fast, right? I mean, you've got to have a certain amount of speed because again, if you want to be that professional and, and everybody wants to talk about the elite, well, the elite is the elite for a reason. You know, the, the, you know some people just want to get out. One of the um, per- people that work here at FMS, he's, 30 years old and still enjoys playing soccer. So, I mean, you know, you don't, you know, it's, it's that deceleration, it's quickness, it's, it's what's all into that. Um, you know, you don't need to build someone just to be able to run straight in a straight line as quick as possible. I think one other thing is the speed that you run in an organized pre-predicted play is different than the speed that you reach down and use based on something, yeah. a situation that just happened in front of you too. So it's unpredictable when yeah. you step on the field of court. Yep. Well, if you ever see me running, you should probably run with me because I'm running away from something. That's right. (laughs) All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here, for watching and listening to this episode. This season of the podcast, we're going to be introducing a new segment where Grace sits down and shares his insights on topics that he's currently passionate about. Enjoy. Hey guys, I want you to think about two words, two words that we should have a complete command of in the movement service industry, whether you're rehabbing people or helping them get their next uh, Olympic gold medal. We need to embrace the words accommodation and adaptation. Now, I've had an opportunity to work with people who are strength enthusiasts and their hobby is lifting. We, could, we got people who spend a lot of time on a bike, a lot of time wearing out running shoes, and a lot of time in a pool. And I want people to do that. Your, your uh, lane of fitness is your lane of fitness. But I, I hate to say this, and I do it myself so I have license to, Anytime we have a sort of myopic focus on fitness, all of a sudden we've got a 21 speed carbon fiber bike that has been bike fit to allow us to slouch comfortably without our hands going numb so we can simply bike further or faster. We've also made some decisions in our lifting that allow us to only do the lifts that are better than everybody else. And we only run uh, routes where we feel fast. My point is, I've been right there when I take somebody who's accomplished a lot of fitness goals in their very narrow lane. 
and I have an opportunity to do a movement screen on them and even a fundamental capacity test on them or a Y balance test, and they find out that they're very, very dysfunctional. And there's a huge problem there. They felt fit in their lane right up until the time I reminded them that they were not a two-dimensional human. They're a three-dimensional human. So I can take somebody who can squat or deadlift a lot and show you how weak they are in a movement screen or a Turkish getup, meaning getting up off the floor, they don't look strong at all. But when they got chalk on their hands and they've got a handle they can pull on and a nice platform they can stand on, they look strong. I've seen cyclists that seem to have a lot of endurance till you make them do something like a sun salutation seven times. And then all of a sudden, they're sucking more air than they did on the last four hills they climbed. I honestly think that if we're the only ones generating our feedback loops in our fitness life, it's easy to have the illusion that you're a little bit more fit than you think you are. But the reason you are is we have an entire exercise and hobby industry that will accommodate anything you can't do and sell it back to you. I promise you, when the, when Titleist built me golf clubs, they were very forgiving golf clubs. They weren't with somebody built for somebody who has a lot of golf skill, meaning I had a tool that was basically made to cover my ineptitude, uh, but that's not what an expert would use. So many times when we get into exercise, we start exercising in a way that we want the accommodation. Oh, it's easier to squat with a heel lift? Hand me that. Oh, it's easier to do this? And hand me that. And so if you're truly thinking that you're adapting, we'll be able to see it in every test we do to you, not just in the scorecard of the thing that you like doing. And I got to own this too. So what we've really got to do is when we get to that point where we're screening somebody or you're getting a screen yourself, you got to realize objective tests tell you where your problems are. Sometimes working on these problems may not change the fact of your cycling or may not help your your personal record lifting. They will simply balance you out in this pursuit of your goal. And being balanced and attaining that goal means you're probably going to be inside of that goal for a lot bigger part of your life instead of being the the one hit one hit wonder that some of us get being when we pursue that fitness sport. So just remember, the entire fitness and hobby athletic industry is built on accommodation to make you feel better than you are so you invest more money in this time slot. The real uh, talk that we have with our human bodies is after a screen. Now, what has been left uncultivated uh, in your pursuit, let's go back and clean that up. It doesn't have to help you take the eye off the prize, but it will build you a better foundation in almost every aspect of it. So ask yourself the next time you think you're fit or you're not, has my situation been accommodated or have I truly adapted? That'll do it for this episode of The Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.